True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The cries and jeers emanating from the darkness could be mistaken for jovial. A group of young men or boys enjoying a night out. But as the cloak of night fades, daylight reveals the true horror, and a sleepy mountain town will never be the same. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 86, The Murder of David Ulaine. This episode is sponsored by the new release, suspense-filled action movie Hot Seat. Orlando Fryer is a former criminal hacker trying to rebuild his life on the straight and narrow, save his marriage, and keep a birthday promise to his daughter. But when he takes his seat in his office on one very ordinary morning, everything changes, and he's suddenly thrust into the role of not only saving his own life, but the entire city from a precious sensitive bomb strapped underneath his chair. One problem, though, the bomber has painted Orlando as the perpetrator, so the police don't see him as a victim. As the bomb squad make their way up 80 floors to Orlando, precious time is ticking away. Starring Mel Gibson, Kevin Dillon and Shannon Doherty, Hot Seat releases in cinemas today, the 22nd of July. And if you entered the ticket giveaway competition, this is the moment you've been waiting for. The winners are Kudzai Nyajeka, Nadine Murphy, Ryan Scheel, and Anne Belinda Fox Porthita. Congratulations! You'll be watching Hot Seat with your chosen partner for free. If you aren't a lucky winner, get online and book your tickets now. Thank you to Hot Seat for supporting True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Pietrus, Kelly Aronser, Eugenie van Straten, and Jennifer Mischen. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads, head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 Rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, Head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discount and support the show at the same time. And you can also get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser, and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. Although any murder can be described as senseless and ruthless, the case I'm covering in today's episode seems to fit that description in the true sense of the phrase. And while there is never any good reason for murder, this one would prove to be the result of absolutely illogical hatred. I'd like to thank Matt Cohen for bringing this case to my attention and for gathering so many resources when suggesting it. Thank you, Matt. Sources for today's episode came from a variety of media articles, YouTube videos, and social media. So let's get into episode 86, The Murder of David Ulaine. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. 
To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. David Olane was born on the 24th of September 1991 in Williston in the Northern Cape. When David was born, South Africa was still under apartheid rule. But three years later, when a new democratic South Africa was born, his birthday would coincide with a public holiday we call Heritage Day, on which all South Africans celebrate the cultural heritage of the many diverse cultures that make up our beautiful nation. It's a day on which we're supposed to reflect on the pride of who we are and what we represent, and that fact would only become sadly ironic when David would lose his life for nothing more than being who he was. David grew up and went to school in the tiny Karoo town of Williston. He was able to acknowledge and accept from an early age that he was gay, and for the most part his family was supportive of his journey to embrace his whole identity. That did not stop the name-calling and bullying he would experience as a gay teen, though. But David was resilient and held his head up high, refusing to buckle to others' ideas of who he should be. For the most part, even the homophobes in the community could not deny that David was just a really fun and kind person to be around. By the time he matriculated, though, he knew he was going to have to carve out his path elsewhere. There were simply no opportunities for work in Williston. And so, in his early 20s, David moved to Cirrus in the Western Cape. Cirrus is the largest town within the Witzenberg local municipality of the Western Cape. It's about 170 kilometers from Cape Town and is surrounded by extremely fertile land in which the bulk of South Africa's deciduous fruits are grown. It's pretty fitting that the name Cirrus comes from that of the Roman goddess of agriculture. To David, coming from Williston, Cirrus would likely have seemed like the big city, and there he found that the LGBTQ community was larger and more welcoming. He also found that the other side of the coin, those who felt it their right to openly express their illogical hatred for the LGBTQ community, was also more prevalent. In fact, although David might not have known it when he moved there, since 2000, at least three members of the LGBTQ community had lost their lives in Cirrus as a result of clearly targeted hate crimes. Despite this undercurrent of hatred, David found a sense of community there. He lived with family in a suburb called Bella Vista, enjoyed participating in the occasional drag queen pageant, and found a job at the family food and meat market. His manager, Heather Miller, who would also become a very good friend, described David as a jolly person who lit up the workplace every morning. She said he would burst into song, turn up the radio, and make her coffee each day. Unfortunately, there is very little information about the run-up to this crime, how David came to be where he was, and indeed, even the details of what really happened seem to be mired in a veil of darkness. I often get most of the important information about a crime from the judgment, but this one has not been uploaded onto Safley, and I believe it's because when the judge passed sentence, He declared that he believed this case was not resolved. I've been unable to determine whether there is still a docket open at Sirius Police Station for this case, and if there is one, that would mean that technically, in some sense, only a partially solved case. With that being said, I will be providing you with the information I do have. It's also important to remember that the version of the story that was presented in court by the prosecution was based around evidence provided by a group of teenagers whose own role in the crime was questioned. The evidence seemed to show that something very different may have happened that night, but we'll get into that too. 
On the evening of Saturday the 22nd of March 2014, a group of seven teenage boys, all aged between 14 and 18, were drinking alcohol at a dam near Bella Vista. It was a common gathering point for teenagers wanting to get away from home and let their hair down. The boys claimed that they were minding their own business when they were approached by 28-year-old Christo Onka. The boys knew Onka as a resident of the neighbourhood. The man was a known drug user and had been arrested by police before for being in possession of narcotics. On that night, the boys claimed that Onka had approached them and asked if they would like to see him kill a, quote, Morphy, end quote. In South Africa, that is a derogatory and homophobic term mostly used to describe gay males, but since homophobes are generally entirely illogical anyway, it's often used as a slur for any person who is not heterosexual. The boys would later claim that they'd initially followed Onka out of curiosity, thinking that the man must surely be high or imagining things. Onka led the seven boys to a nearby pump station, which had not been in use for a very long time. When they arrived at the structure, they saw a person bound with wire. The person's face and head was covered in blood, and he was lying motionless on the ground. The boys claimed that they then watched as Onka proceeded to assault the person with a brick on his head and body. He punched and kicked the person, who only groaned in response. Then, he struck the man with a large rock on the head, placed branches around his body, and set him alight. The boys claimed that Onka had restarted the fire on several occasions because it had burned out. The man on the ground was no longer moving or making any sounds, and they watched as the fire licked at the man's clothing. They later claimed that they stayed and watched because they were afraid not to. They were intoxicated and shocked by the horror unfolding before them, they said. But they weren't just watching. At least one of the boys pulled out his cell phone and started filming. Then, as the fire seemed to take hold of the man's body, the boys said they drifted off into the night going back to the dam for a while, and eventually stumbling home. When dawn broke on Sunday the 23rd of March 2014, David Orlane's bed was empty, and his family immediately started to wonder why he hadn't come home. He had been out the night before, but he'd always returned or let them know if he planned to sleep out. Back at the disused pump station, some of the boys, having awoken from their drunken slumber, decided to return to the scene of the previous night's horror. They would later claim that they hadn't been sure if what they remembered had been real, so they'd gone there to see if it was. When they arrived, they no longer had to wonder. The previous night's events had been no hallucination. There lay the deceased body of a young man, his body wrapped in wire, now partially burned, and very clearly no longer alive. They also noticed that the man was naked from the waist down, something they claim they hadn't seen the night before. The boys would say that in the light of day and with clearer minds, they sought out the first adult they could find to report the situation, but the woman who would eventually end up calling police said that the boys had not sought her out. She had been walking near the pump station when she saw the boys walking away from it, and she overheard them saying things that made her concerned. Only when she pressed them about what they had been talking about had one of them suggested she go over and take a look for herself. 
When serious police officers arrived at the pump station, it was immediately cordoned off as a crime scene. By then, though, word had already spread to Bella Vista that a body had been found, and David Olane's friends and family, knowing that this was on the route he would have taken home the night before, started to become concerned. Although the body had not been entirely consumed by the fire set by the killer, it had been damaged beyond the point of facial recognition. So when David's next of kin reported to police that he was missing and they were concerned that he may be the unidentified murder victim, a physical identification seemed unlikely. But one of David's best friends was willing to try. The woman attended the mortuary later that day, and the victim's face was blackened and charred. David Olane's favourite physical feature about himself had been his thick, luxurious hair, and it was just a few tufts of this that remained through which he would be initially identified. DNA would later confirm what his friend had believed. 23-year-old David Olane had been murdered. The investigation into this murder would later be strongly criticised, and it appears that this criticism was entirely warranted. Although police were quickly able to locate the seven teenagers who'd been at the pump station that night, and those boys identified Krista Onka as the perpetrator, which led to a speedy arrest, it seems that this is exactly where the investigation went off the rails. In the days after David's murder, his friends and family became aware of video footage that had been taken by some of the boys that night. Some of them viewed that footage, and allegedly told police it existed, but detectives from Sirius Police are believed to have declined to look at the video, and eventually when it was requested from the boys, it had been deleted from their phones. Of course, there is every possibility that the phone memory could have been searched for the video, and it could have been retrieved by investigators despite it being deleted. Nothing, after all, is really deleted in this digital age. But no one seemed to think it was necessary. Police had seven witnesses who said that Christo Onka had murdered David Olane. Surely this would be sufficient. The question is, should it have been enough? It seems that the police simply accepted the testimony of the seven boys that they had been involuntary witnesses to the horrors that had taken place that night. But from the beginning, the vast majority of people who knew David, as well as human rights and LGBTQ activist organizations, did not believe that this was the case. A journalist who'd spoken to the group of boys shortly after the crime painted a rather disturbing picture too. Mahia Pretorius approached the group one day as they were kicking a soccer ball around on a dusty field. They briefly spoke with him about what they'd seen, but what stood out for him the most was the way they came across. He'd expected to find a group of teenagers who were traumatised by what they'd seen. He'd been prepared to suggest counselling to help them cope. But what he found instead were seven boys who seemed not to think very much at all about the horror that had unfolded that night. He explained that they seemed to have seen the murder as just another event in their lives that didn't really stand out. Pretorius put this down to the level of violence the boys may have been exposed to in their day-to-day lives. They must have been desensitized from living in a violent environment, he thought. This, of course, was before evidence came to light, which suggested that Onka had not acted alone. David Olane was a relatively strong man. No one who knew him 
believed that he would have been disabled by a single attacker. Investigators claimed that David had been struck from behind with a brick and that the head injury had rendered him unconscious. While this was entirely possible, most were still not buying that more than one person had not been directly involved in the murder. In fact, at one point, a family member of Christo Onka came forward to say that he had been an eyewitness to the crime, but police allegedly refused to interview him, saying that his familial connection to Onka meant his testimony would be unreliable. It also emerged that the police had only interviewed some witnesses upon insistence from family members, and some were only spoken to six months after the crime had taken place. Another thing that seriously bothered activists and those that loved David was that his murder was not being described as a hate crime. According to the boys' testimonies, Onka had very specifically targeted David because he was gay, but neither the police nor the eventual prosecutor in this case would present the murder as such. In fairness, South African law does not yet have a specific provision for hate crimes, and we'll get into this a bit later in the episode. And also, according to South African law, motive does not need to be proven in court. But the targeting of a man solely due to his sexual orientation would be an aggravating circumstance in this murder, and it should have been. David was not accidentally killed in the commission of a robbery or beaten up in a fight over some inconsequential disagreement. He was targeted, hunted, and slaughtered because of the illogical hatred his murderer held for his sexual identity. Although every detail in this case had already been shocking enough, when Christo Onka appeared in court for the first time and the charge sheet was read out, a collective gasp was heard when it became public knowledge that Onka was being charged with rape. The autopsy had found that David Orlane had been raped before he was killed. Semen was found in and around his anus. Christo Onka applied for bail, but it was denied, and as the trial seemed to begin in earnest in June of that year, the shocking revelation that David had also been raped had turned into yet another mystery in this case, when, by the next time Onka appeared in court, the rape charge had mysteriously disappeared from the charge sheet. The DNA from the rape kits would have taken some time to process, and clearly it did not come back as a match to Onka, otherwise the charge would have remained. Now that's not to say it didn't belong to Onka, because the semen had been exposed to the heat of the fire, and it's entirely possible that this damaged it. But if the state's case was that Onka and Onka alone was responsible for David or Lane's death, and there was clear evidence of rape, then why would he not be responsible for that rape as well? Of course, Onka may have argued that the sex was consensual, and that while he'd had sex with Orlane, he had not killed him, but considering his very clear homophobic stance, there was little chance he was going to argue that, and honestly, the state would have lost nothing by continuing on with the rape charge. There may well have been a very reasonable reason for the removal of that charge from the sheet, but it was never explained, and considering the fact that so many people believed others had been involved in David's murder, the silence on this matter just gives us more reason to question whether that DNA was actually entirely testable and still did not match Christo Onka. The trial would be closely followed and attended by both friends and family of David Orlane, some having to travel several hundred kilometres each time, as well as activists from various organisations, 
including the Triangle Project. The case was to be heard under Judge Siraj Desai in Cirrus, and although that court at that time was not set up on the High Court circuit, it was given that title for this specific case due to the intense interest from the community. Judge Desai retired in 2020 after a 25-year tenure in the High Court of the Western Cape. You will have heard me mention his name in several other episodes, including the murder of Talib Peterson and the Van Breda family murder episodes. Desai was not known for towing the line in terms of keeping things unsaid that others would prefer not to be made known, and it seems fitting that he would be the judge at this trial, which seemed to represent a truly dark veil of mystery. Prosecuting the case for the state was advocate Nsuaki Mabialetsa. Despite proceedings starting relatively soon after Christo was arrested and charged, the trial would be a long, drawn-out affair, consisting of numerous postponements. Also in attendance at the trial was Onka's family and friends, who steadfastly believed in his innocence. The one belief both they and David's side of the proceedings shared was that there were most definitely others out there who should have been sitting in the dark. Onka's mother told journalists that her son had a very low IQ and she didn't believe he could function on a level where he could plan such an attack. She also said that she had seen Christo's clothing on the night of the murder and there was no blood on them. In addition to outrage around the delays in the trial and the lack of acknowledgement that this was a hate crime, LGBTQ and human rights activists in the area wanted to engage with police to create a more solid relationship between the community and the police. A meeting was arranged between activist organizations and the police, but serious police arrived an hour after the start time and immediately asked to be excused, allegedly saying they had important things to do. This, at least in the activists' opinions, painted a perfect picture of the type of cooperation they could expect from the SAPS in trying to foster better relations and reduce the prevalence of hate crimes, like David's murder. After 20 months and 35 court appearances, on the 21st of January 2016, Christo Onka was eventually found guilty of the murder of David Olain. The sentencing date was set for the 22nd of February, but the trial had seemingly set the pace for even that portion of justice, and it would take another five postponements for the pronouncements to eventually be handed down. Judge Siraj Desai expressed his own frustration at one point at how inefficiencies in the system were delaying the process. One of the reasons for the postponement was that the judge requested that Onka be sent for psychological assessment. His mother's claims that the man was well below average IQ level concerned the judge, and he'd also noticed that Onka had difficulty testifying in his own defence. A significantly low IQ would certainly be taken into account in sentencing if it was true, and it had been discovered that Onka was partially illiterate. While he seemed to be able to read a bit, he could not write his own name. Eventually, on the 12th of October 2016, Judge Desai was able to hand down his sentence. For those in the LGBTQ community, the day held additional significance. Eighteen years before, on that exact day, another young man lost his life, simply because he was gay. Matthew Shepard was beaten, tortured and left to die on the 6th of October 1998 in Wyoming, USA. He died six days later in hospital. Matthew's attackers were found guilty of his murder and sentenced to life in prison. But just as with David's case, there was no facility in US law at the time 
to proclaim the murder a hate crime. Matthew Shepard's murder would eventually result in President Obama signing the Matthew Shepard Act in 2009, which created a law defining certain acts, including homophobic murder and assault, as hate crimes. So it seemed fitting that on that same day, Judge Desai looked out over the court, which contained the people of Cirrus, and declared that even though there was no law to support a charge of a hate crime, it was clear to him that this is what had taken place. And then he said what had been on everyone's mind since David Orlane's body was found. While he believed that Christo Unka had been involved in David's murder, he did not believe he'd acted alone. He urged the SAPS to continue investigating the case and bring the other perpetrators to book. Then, after mentioning some mitigating factors he'd taken into account, which included Onka's low IQ, which had been confirmed during his psychological assessment, as well as this being his first conviction for a violent offence, Judge Desai said that he also believed that if the full story and all the perpetrators were brought to light, that Onka's role in the crime may be proven to be as an accessory rather than the main perpetrator. He therefore felt that a fair sentence, given all the circumstances, would be 17 years in prison. To date, No other perpetrators have been arrested or prosecuted for the murder of David Olane. The seven boys who were present that night went on with their lives, and a whole remained where a cheerful and happy young man had once existed. As far as our LGBTQ community is concerned, South Africa is a place of vast dichotomy. We have one of the most robust sets of constitutional rights protecting the rights of people within this community, yet we seem utterly poor at enforcing these rights, and within so many of our diverse cultures, homophobia is still very real. If you struggle to understand why it is important to highlight hate crimes like David or Lane's murder, you likely don't have anyone close to you who is gay. And that's okay. Maybe you just need to associate it with something that's more relevant to your own lived experience. How would you feel if someone decided you needed to die because of the colour of the skin you were born with? Or let's make it even more ridiculous. What if there was someone living next door to you who believed that because you were born with blonde hair, you don't deserve to live. Sounds a bit crazy, right? That's because it is. Just like someone should not have to die because they have a certain colour hair, they certainly should not die because in their own bedrooms they interact with a specific set of genitals. A phobia is defined as an illogical fear and homophobia could not be more illogical. But fear is one thing. Hatred is quite another. Fear comes from not understanding. Hatred comes from a place of believing you have been wronged. How did David or Lane harm anyone? How? I will not pretend to fully understand the mind of a person who could do something like this, nor would I want to. Nor will I pretend to understand how it feels to live with the fear of being attacked, bullied, insulted, discriminated against, raped or killed simply on the basis of my identity. What I can try to understand, though, is what can be done so that this never has to happen again. Whenever any campaign is launched around LGBTQ rights, I so often see people saying, why do we have to talk about this all the time? Or my all-time not-so-favourite, 
Stop shoving this stuff down my throat. Well, if this stuff, which by the way is a human rights issue, is not brought to the fore, then people will continue to die. And if you're okay with that, then you shouldn't mind too much if you're next. Just because you're not gay doesn't mean you're not impacted. And if you cannot have empathy for others, then surely you can see how a hate crime might one day impact you if someone decides on a whim that your core identity is not to their liking. One of the issues that activists who attended the trial for David's murder wanted to bring to the fore was the hate crimes bill. As previously mentioned, South Africa is in the same situation the US was when Matthew Shepard was killed. We do not have a legal definition for a hate crime, and therefore cannot charge anyone with it. The Open Society Foundation for South Africa produced an advocacy brief around the proposed hate crimes bill, which clearly explains why such legislation is so important, and not just to the LGBTQ community. In it, they define a hate crime as being, quote, based on two factors. The first is that the act is considered a crime under existing South African criminal law, such as arson, damage to property, assault, rape or murder. The second is that the act is motivated in whole or in part by prejudice or hatred regarding an aspect of the victim's identity, such as their race, nationality, religion, or sexual orientation, end quote. Although hate crimes are committed against an individual, the prejudice displayed in the act impacts an entire community. If someone, for instance, is targeted for being Jewish, the entire Jewish community will feel that they too are at risk. When offenders are sentenced, one of the aspects of the crime taken into account by a judge is the impact the crime has on the community. In a hate crime, as opposed to a random crime, the impact on the community runs far deeper, and that should be reflected in the sentence. In some hate crimes where people have been targeted because of their race, such as the Skillic mass shooting in which four people, including a three-month-old baby, were killed by Johan Nell in a racially motivated attack, the sentence did reflect the crime. But this is not always the case. And if the hate crimes bill was passed, this could change. Those in favour of passing the hate crimes bill also say that it is not just a legal issue but also one which will enable real data to be collected around the prevalence of hate crimes against many different communities. The rather pleasant irony of the hate crimes bill for me is that it is one piece of legislation that two groups of people who are often opposed can actually agree on. There are many different religious groups whose tenets claim to be opposed to homosexuality, and as a result, such religious groups are often pitted against the LGBTQ community. But here's the irony bit. Members of those religious groups would benefit just as much as those in the LGBTQ community from hate crimes being recognised, because there's nothing stopping an individual targeting people from any religious group, simply because of the religion that forms part of their identity. The bill was put before Parliament for the first time in 2016, and the most recent update I can find is from March 2022, when the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services held a public hearing on the bill which is part of the process of deciding whether or not it will be implemented. David Olayne was deeply loved by those who knew him. 
He was laid to rest in his hometown of Williston, near his mother's home, where she can visit his final resting place. While it seems highly likely that Christo Unke was involved in David's murder, there is almost no doubt that others escaped justice, and perhaps partial justice is no justice at all. I'm always hesitant when the murder of an individual sparks a hashtag movement and becomes a cause, because I feel that sometimes that detracts from the place the victim holds in the world. So when I came across a statement by Matthew Clayton of the Triangle Project about David and his murder, it really resonated with me, and I wanted to use it to close out this episode. We want to reinforce that David was his own person. He was not Christo Onka's victim. He was not the Triangle Project's cause. And he is not a martyr. David was a young man who loved to dance, make his friends laugh, and who was saving money from his job. He did not deserve this death, and now his memory deserves our respect. Rest gently, David. Thank you for listening to episode 86, The Murder of David Olane. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media, We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. 